Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. After I graduated from college, I was doing beadwork embroidery on custom-made clothing, and I kind of gradually stepped into doing some jewelry. My sister-in-law had a bead shop, and I thought I would do her a favor and help her with inventory, knowing nothing about making jewelry. Um, and what I found was that I wasn't happy with my work because I had to choose from beads that everybody else had. And you end up with a look that everybody else has too. So I decided that if I wanted my work to look different, I was going to have to make my own beads. And thank God that we don't know what we're getting ourselves into. <laughs> so I ended up buying a torch and some glass and studying like the chemistry of glass, annealing points, more technical aspects that you need to know, and then just playing with the glass to find my own style. And it went really well. So I just, you know, for probably three, four years, every time I sold something, I bought a new piece of equipment or a new batch of glass. The glass blowing actually took probably about four years to really get to a point that I felt good about. It takes a lot of practice. And I think we're ready to apply the glass color. So having steady hands is really important. Um, people recognize me for the glass flowers that I do. They're called implosion pendants, and a lot of times you'll see glass pendants where it looks kind of psychedelic, like there's bubbles coming out. But when I do those, I arrange the glass so it pops out into a flower. And I didn't really realize I was doing so many flowers until people started coming in and they would say, oh, you really love flowers, don't you? Yes, I really do love flowers. It's like a marriage between gravity, heat, and breath because your shape that you get is ultimately going to be how well do you have everything aligned, how well is it centered, how hot is your flame, how much breath are you blowing into it. And it, it does take a long time to do it well, you know. There are a lot of wonky beads out there in the world from my early days. <laughs> But the thing about doing art is that even if you're in that learning stage, you still get such a deep sense of satisfaction from doing it. So it doesn't matter. And if you put it in the right piece of jewelry, it looks like it's supposed to be that way. And it is. And the other cool thing about glass is that you're never ever done learning. No matter how good you get and how far you go, you can spend a lifetime and just keep getting better, you know? And at this stage in the glass, I could continue on with what I'm doing, or I could choose from probably three other things that it could be right now. But we'll, we'll go on with the bead. So that will become the front of the bead. We're about half done at this point. Okay, so it's thickening up really nicely. It's flattening out, but 
We have to find a way to get air in there and pop it into the right shape and pop out another hole. Sometimes when I get to this point, I look at them and I think they're so pretty that they should be a bottle and then I won't poke the, poke the other, blow the other hole out on the side. I'll just add either a base or I'll add a lip around it so that I can wire wrap it into a hanging bottle. It just depends on uh, how I feel about it at this point. I actually started making the bottles because I've always had a bit fascination with tiny things. And those were some of the first things I ever started making. But uh, as I did shows, people kept telling me the story about tear bottles. In ancient Egypt and Rome, when a loved one passed away, they would take bottles and fill them with their tears. And then they would put them in the tombs. And so, I can't tell you how many people said, you have to call these tear bottles. These are tear bottles. And finally, after about a year and a half, I said, well, okay, they're tear bottles. And so a lot of times families will come in when they've lost someone and they will buy them for ashes or they'll use, some people really do put their tears in them actually. Um, but I dry flowers from funerals and then I put the flower petals in them and give them as gifts. So we've got our bead here and we, what we need to do is pop out another hole. So that's what we're going to do. Ah, success. Okay, so now we have to take the tubing off of the other side and fire polish it all so it looks nice. Okay, I think we can live with that. The step that sometimes gets forgotten is that you really have to soak this in the heat before you put it in the kiln because we go in and out of the flame so much it introduces stress into the glass and even though you can't see cracks if you don't really soak it with heat those cracks can appear later on so I think it's done and it's ready to go in the kiln now this one is pretty transparent because of the colors that I've used so when I actually incorporate that into the jewelry, I'm going to take advantage of the transparency and fill it up with something. It might be beads or notes or who knows. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org. If you have segment ideas pertaining to North Central Minnesota, Contact us at legacy at lptv.org. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund by the vote of the people on November 4th, 2008.